Speedruns are all about, well, going fast. And the key factor in going fast just so happens to be how you move. So it seems obvious that the way you move in a game is the most important factor in how fast you can go. Speedrunners have explored all sorts of ways to move fast in games, but one method is particularly iconic, due in part to the incredible lineage of games that it stems from. Enter bunny hopping. Generally, bunny hopping is the act of repeatedly jumping forward while strafing through the air to gain forward momentum. In most circumstances, this involves not holding the forward button and jumping the instant you land to maintain velocity. Apart from speedrunning, bunny hopping is also done recreationally and also plays a role in competitive multiplayer games to this day. Moreover, I believe the discovery and the proliferation of bunny hopping across decades of gaming expresses something fundamental about what gamers actually want out of a video game experience. Something of a lost art that developers have only recently begun to re-explore. First, I'm going to dissect and compare some games that include some sort of bunny hopping or similar movement techniques. I do not claim to be an authority on all of these game specific movements, but I have consulted with experts for each of these games to make sure that my information is as valid as possible. In the beginning, there was Quake, and all others bowed before it. Released in June of 1996, it was one of the first true 3D environment first person shooters. Similar to games like Doom, but Quake had something other games in that genre did not have. A complex movement system. Trying to imitate real life physics, the developers created the NetQuake engine, inadvertently giving birth to the best movement tech in gaming. Quake is where the entire concept of bunny hopping was invented. Hell, it's arguably where most of speedrunning was invented. People trying to improve how fast they were going started to notice trends in their fastest times. Strafing around corners seemed to be faster than going in a straight line. In time, people noticed that jumping seemed to maintain this speed, and if you buffered multiple jumps in a row, you could link them together. This is the framework for what would become bunny hopping. Bunny hopping in Quake is actually rather simple in comparison to other games with similar movement. The base movement speed in Quake is 304 when moving in a straight line. Turning with the mouse increases the speed. When moving in more than one direction, you can also slightly increase your speed. This is amplified by the camera movement in the same direction. If you increase your speed by strafing, then jump at the peak speed, you maintain this enhanced speed for the duration of the jump. You don't lose any speed while in the air. This is known as pre-strafing, and it is how to start every single chain of bunny hopping. Once the chain is started, runners will then proceed to do similar mouse movements, jumping the moment they hit the ground to try and maintain the speed over many jumps. In Quake, when you touch the ground even for a moment, you lose a bit of speed. The player must counteract this by gaining what is known as air acceleration. Air acceleration can be gained by strafing, just like you would on the ground, but in the air. This counteracts the speed decrease from touching the ground, causing you to consistently accelerate. So if you don't strafe in the air, you will eventually lose all of your speed. That may be a lot to digest, but think of it this way. You start by building up momentum with a pre-strafe. Then you maintain this momentum by jumping. Then, you gain more momentum by air strafing. With a successful chain of bunny hops in Quake, you only touch the forward key at the start during the pre-strafe. The whole time after that, you are using air acceleration you gain from the air strafing to push yourself forward. The same principle also applies when going backwards, except you aim the mouse in the opposite direction. These are the fundamentals of bunny hopping but every game that features this movement tech has their own unique quirks. In Quake, a successful bunny hop can get you anywhere in the 500 speed range. But Quake speedrunners are not satisfied with that. In Quake, there is a type of bunny hopping called power bunny hopping. This is a technique that requires the runner to press W while bunny hopping as they hit the floor on each hop. As it turns out, holding W in Quake while bunny hopping only loses speed while in the air, 
So for that instant that you were touching the ground, you can press W and this will negate a lot of that slowdown you usually get when you touch the ground. This can get you into the 550 to 600 range. Techniques like this are used to maintain velocity across entire maps and can be even used during combat to increase mobility and avoid attacks. The NetQuick engine inspired many gamers and developers alike with its unique skill-based movement system. Unfortunately for fans, abusing system mechanics was not looked fondly upon by the original developers. Just one year later, Quake 2 was released. And while it wasn't as popular or influential in speedrunning, it still had a similar status. The bunny hopping in Quake 1, even at the time, was very well known. In an effort to remove this technique from the sequel, the developers removed the ability to gain speed in the air by strafing. This also made it so that holding down forward did not remove any speed while in the air. No longer were runners prevented from pressing W while bunny hopping. But at the same time, the technique itself was basically gutted. Quake 3 and 4 both have similar problems as Quake 2. It was clear that developers really didn't like this unintended use of their movement mechanics, and would actively try to remove it from any game they could. The removal of skill-based movement systems in favor of systems that are much more manageable, but don't reward mastery over the mechanics, is a problem that would permeate gaming throughout this era. Likewise, developers targeting bunny hopping for elimination is a theme that we'll revisit through this video. In the wake of the Quake series came what I like to call the second renaissance of bunny hopping, with the release of Half-Life in 1998. Half-Life took the gaming world by storm, revolutionizing the single player experience. It also just so happened to revolutionize the speedrunning world as well. Air strafing was back, and while having different numerical values than Quake, functions very similarly. Walking in any direction can get you up to 320 speed. The way in which you are limited to this speed is that ground and walls have a friction value added to them. So when you come into contact with them, a multiplier is placed on your momentum, making you not accelerate past a certain speed. This does not apply to the ceiling, however, which means in Half-Life, you can bounce your head off the ceiling and never lose speed. However, you can abuse the physics to actually gain speed from this wall friction by running along the wall at specific angles and pressing into it. This is known as wall strafing and increases your speed significantly. If you were to compare how strafing works to a real life example, you would be comparing it to centrifugal force. A centrifugal force is the force that pushes on an object that is spinning in a circle. This is the same force that pushes you into the window of your car when you take a sharp turn. That added momentum when changing directions is what gives you more speed when strafing. This momentum is then applied into a direction that is desired and propels the player forward. While on the ground, this means that optimally you can achieve a speed of about 500 if strafing perfectly. Half-Life is a frame rate based game. That means the game checks values for its gameplay based on the frames per second it is being run at. This is important for bunny hopping, because the friction values that are applied are based on how many frames you're touching the ground or wall. Generally, speedruns of Half-Life are run at 100 frames per second, because that is the maximum frame rate that the game can be ran at at the version that is speedrun. Later versions would allow higher frame rate caps, but also implemented speed caps. Jump is remapped to the scroll wheel, because then you can spam the scroll when you're going to hit the ground, to more easily maintain your momentum. When playing at higher FPS, the penalty for not hitting the jump input on the first frame is reduced, because the amount of time that you're touching the ground is also reduced. Since you're reducing the amount of time you're touching the ground when bunny hopping, your acceleration can skyrocket through the roof, especially with the introduction of damage boosts. While prevalent in Quake, Half-Life really brought the damage boost into bunny hopping. With complex setups having the player hit themselves with an explosion to give them a large amount of velocity, then maintain this velocity with bunny hopping. The exploitation of these mechanics makes Half-Life one of the coolest and most popular speed games out there to this day. I only briefly covered everything that is involved with the movement mechanics in Half-Life. If you want a full deep dive into the exact details of these mechanics, there are some wonderful guys that I used to learn. Link in the description. 
So just when it seemed the industry entirely removed complex movement mechanics from its games, Half-Life was there to breathe life back into the formula. Half-Life was so popular, in fact, that it spawned hundreds of popular modifications, many of which embraced, or at least had some of these movement mechanics involved. The most notable one being Counter-Strike in 2000. Counter-Strike took the movement from Half-Life and applied this to a competitive first-person shooter. This created some of the most insane moments in esports history, with the movement being an important aspect of being a pro player. It was nerfed in a few ways, increasing the amount of slowdown that you get if you don't land the jump unless it's the very first frame, as well as adding a cap onto how fast you could bunny hop. This greatly benefited the competitive scene, as it was increasing the skill ceiling beyond aim and awareness. Some people liked these mechanics so much that they created their own maps just to explore and test their skill with these mechanics. Players such as Creeds, who invented the movement map style KZ, dedicated insane amounts of hours into learning and mastering these mechanics. Often these maps would be played with slightly different settings than default Counter-Strike and would be designed as such. This gave birth to the bunny hop map KZ and Surf. Surf is a technique invented by the player known as Marion where if you're falling against the slanted surface, you can hold into the surface and gain or lose speed depending on the pitch of your mouse to the wall. He originally created maps to test your skill with his mechanic. Surf and Bunny Hop would only become more important in the next version of Counter-Strike. The next iteration of Counter-Strike was released in 2004, debuting the newly created Source Engine. So what did this new game have to offer when it comes to movement? Well, it was essentially the same as Counter-Strike 1.6, but the aptly named Counter-Strike Source did not carry over the movement nerfs of its predecessor. For the longest time, Counter-Strike Source was a professionally played eSport with bunny hopping. Most players didn't have a firm understanding of what these mechanics could really do, but a few, like the legendary Foon, used bunny hopping to maximize their advantage. When stuff like this started to happen, people went insane. Some were extremely upset. They thought that the movement like that could only be achieved through scripting, a cheat that uses a program to automatically hit perfect bunny hops for you. Some players were inspired and tried to incorporate perfect bunny hopping into their gameplay. This led to the proliferation of bunny hop maps, surf maps. To this day, Counter-Strike Source probably has the largest community based entirely in bunny hopping. But just because some people love these movement mechanics, and even made whole mods surrounding them, does not mean that they were universally praised. Once again, the developers did not like their game being abused with these mechanics, so they set out to fix them. In Counter-Strike Source, they actually fixed it pretty well. They added a bunny hop cap and essentially stopped the action they didn't want happening. However, because it was Valve, this kicked off a trend of developers trying to fix things only for them to come back 10 times more broken. Call it karma. 15 days after the release of Counter-Strike Source, Valve released the much anticipated Half-Life 2. The Source engine was unchanged, but the game itself attempted to stop players from abusing these movement mechanics. Originally, there was a mechanic where jumping would give you an increased speed so jumping over and over would increase your speed greatly. However, there was next to no air acceleration, so bunny hopping per se was not exactly possible. That is, until they tried to patch this forward jumping speed with a similar patch to the one they used in Counter-Strike. This new engine patch, creatively dubbed New Engine, brought us a few new mechanics into the game. Besides these initial nerfs, Movement is basically the same as in Half-Life 1, except half the speed. However, there was now the implementation of a sprint mechanic. The sprint mechanic actually just increases the acceleration you get, so holding the sprint button at all times makes the gameplay functionally the same movement-wise as Half-Life 1. Another major thing they did was switch from a frame rate based system to a tick rate one. So no longer would players be running the game at higher FPS to guarantee better bunny hops, the game's tick rate could also not really be changed, so what they got was what they were stuck with. Thankfully, 
what they got was a lot. The tick based system was more convenient and consistent than the frame rate based one, so bunny hopping was actually more consistent. There was still one fundamental problem with bunny hopping in Half-Life 2 though. Gaining speed was hard. With no air acceleration, you could only go as fast as you could strafe on the ground or boost yourself with grenades. That was until the discovery of something known as ABH. ABH, or Accelerated Backwards Hopping, is a method that uses the game trying to cap your speed when jumping forward. In Half-Life 2, Whenever you try to jump forward above the speed cap, the game applies a velocity in the opposite direction to the player, equal to the amount of velocity the player was above the speed cap. So if you're going 20 units faster than the speed cap, the game will apply 20 units velocity in the opposite direction. Normally, this would just equalize your speed to the cap. However, the game never actually checks which direction you are moving, so you can abuse this to give you increased speed while going backwards. To perform ABH, you will start a normal bunny hop sequence to get to the speed cap and then you turn around and just bunny hop backwards. Each time, the game will try to slow you down by applying velocity to the player in the opposite direction. In this case, the opposite direction is the direction you are going, so instead of reducing the speed, it actually increases your speed. So let's say you're going 300 units above the speed cap. The game will add 300 units to your speed. Then, when you jump again, your speed will be 600 units, and the game will add another 600 units of speed to your main speed. Basically, you trick the game into increasing your speed exponentially by facing the opposite direction. This technique entirely breaks Half-Life 2. If you thought regular bunny hopping was fast, then ABH will blow your mind. This technique can also be done facing forward while holding S. Tricking the game into thinking you're going backwards and giving you forward velocity. This trick is also known as AFH, or Accelerated Forward Hopping. This is a bit slower and not as useful as ABH. So trying to limit bunny hopping, Valve accidentally made it 10 times worse. Or better, depending on what you're looking for. While it isn't exactly the very high skill ceiling movement tech that people love from Quake and Half-Life, it is very very fun and very very fast. The next major game to take advantage of these new movement mechanics was the famous first person shooter puzzle game, Portal. Running on essentially the same engine as Half-Life 2, Portal takes advantage of similar techniques like ABH and AFH. However, since Portal takes place in mostly small, enclosed spaces, lots of techniques for bunny hopping are not that useful. Not to mention the use of a portal gun that if used correctly, can transmit you across entire levels instantaneously. There isn't really much need to gain lots of velocity when you can move at infinite speed by teleporting. Regardless of this, there are some uses for Portal's movement mechanics, like this skip in Chamber 8. In 2008, Valve released their next big project that they've been working on, Left 4 Dead. Left 4 Dead changed the formula on multiplayer games at the time, straying away from competitive first-person shooters, player versus player, and more towards competitive multiplayer against a very advanced AI. Left 4 Dead was essentially a beta test for the insane AI computations that Valve had in store for the sequel. From a movement technique perspective, Left 4 Dead initially seems very limiting, but actually this is only because of the low tick rate enforced on the game by the multiplayer aspect. In order to make the game run well across servers for up to 8 people, Valve decided to cap the game's tick rate at 30 ticks per second. This is opposed to 60 ticks per second as normal. This caused bunny hopping to be tick perfect for you to not lose most of your speed. You also cannot use scroll wheel on a mouse to time your jumps in Left 4 Dead, as it is simply too imprecise. So Left 4 Dead is one of the few games where you actually bunny hop with the spacebar, or some other single key. Bunny hopping with a single key makes it significantly harder than a lot of other games, especially since most enemy spawns in the game are random, so this makes the path that you have to take for your movement random every single time. Exactly one year later, we get the sequel that they had planned, Left 4 Dead 2. From a movement perspective, the games are actually exactly the same. 
The only thing that changes across the games was the netcode and the hit detection, as well as some characters and maps. As with Left 4 Dead, Portal would also soon get a sequel that was a bit further out from its initial release. In 2011, we received Portal 2, and unlike Left 4 Dead 2, there was a lot changed across games. Primarily, while air strafing now does accelerate you, they stop bunny hopping once and for all by making you lose all control over your movement after you pass a certain speed. In Portal 2, the speed is actually super low. After about one or two hops, you lose all air control. Not only is this the case, but ABH and AFH are both no longer possible. It seems Valve finally succeeded in removing these unwanted mechanics. Speaking of unwanted mechanics, in 2012, Counter-Strike was back with its newest iteration, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, or CSGO. Initially, CSGO did have some sort of bunny hopping. On launch, the game had pre-straight, that thing that we talked about all the way back in Quake. You could also gain a lot of air acceleration while bunny hopping. This was inevitably nerfed, as pro players and devs alike didn't really like it that much. They nerfed the bunny hopping, but it's not entirely gone. You can still hit some hops every now and again, but the days of Foon are long gone. Now, CSGO is more about the smoothness of your movement rather than speed. At this point, it really seemed like skill-based movement systems and games was dead. No new games really had any sort of bunny hopping, whether it be multiplayer or single player games. The industry just really didn't want to have games out there where people would play them in ways they didn't want. And since Valve started to hide away and just print bunny, with Steam, no new Valve games could come out and break this cycle. That is, until Titanfall released, in 2014. Titanfall was created by Respawn Studios, founded by Jason West and Vince Zampella, both of whom were ex-Infinity War employees and helped to create Call of Duty, which also had bunny hop-like movements. The studio put a lot of effort into the movement mechanics of their game, while it was multiplayer only, it had an insane amount of movement tech. Double jumps, wall runs, and other mechanics permeate the game. Bunny hopping in Titanfall is interesting because of the notable other movement mechanics. Namely, the double jump makes it so you can't map jump to scroll for bunny hopping, otherwise you will accidentally use both of your jumps. So timing is needed, but it is much more forgiving than in, say, Left 4 Dead. However, since Titanfall wasn't a huge commercial success, not many people really mastered the movement mechanics until the sequel. The reboot of Doom, released in 2016, is another example of a modern game that emphasized fast, skill-based movement. Trying to create forward momentum in the player, always flying around and on the attack. While, like its predecessors, it doesn't feature proper bunny hopping, you can maintain your momentum by jumping the instant you land. With the combination of rail boosts and goss boosts, this can effectively maintain high levels of velocity across large sections of the map. While Titanfall had a lot going for it in the movement mechanics department, Titanfall 2 doubled down. Now a fully fledged game with a single player campaign as well as a competitive multiplayer scene, Titanfall 2 is currently the most impressive game on the market in the movement mechanics department. Not only does Titanfall 2 have wall runs and double jump mechanics from the original, it also has a new slide mechanic. When you crouch while sprinting, you will break into a slide, and this slide gives a speed boost. This speed can be then maintained by jumping. Then you can use air strafing to essentially increase speed, and bunny hopping while crouching. In the community, this is called crouch hopping. Titanfall 2 also has traditional bunny hopping, similar to Half-Life. However, this is a much harder technique compared to crouch hopping. You can also increase your velocity by running on walls. At the very end of any wall run, you can jump at the right time to get a speed boost. This also applies to when you're being forced off a wall because you have been on it for too long. You can also bunny hop off of walls. Instead of running on the wall, if you jump the instant you start a wall run, it essentially works the same way as a traditional bunny hop, maintaining your momentum and even giving you a small speed boost. Combining all this with the double jump and traditional air strafing as well as damage boosting, and you have the golden child of bunny hopping movement tech. All of these mechanics apply to both the single player and the multiplayer to varying effects. But the real thing here to be noted is that Titanfall 2 did what no other game wanted to do at the time. 
incentivize learning a complex skill-based movement system. While other companies were set out to destroy all weird movement and homogenize the industry, Titanfall 2 took a risk and made the most robust movement system in any game that I know. Hopefully this marks an upward trend in what game developers think about movement mechanics in games. Unfortunately, Titanfall 2's multiplayer didn't really take off. It wasn't going to be the next big esport, and not many people really picked it up and stuck with it. But that was okay, because Respawn Studios had a trick up their sleeve. Cashing in on the new Battle Royale trend, they used the engine and some mechanics from Titanfall 2 to make Apex Legends. While Titanfall 2 didn't really have a chance at becoming one of the great esports, Apex was handcrafted to be exactly that. While it did remove some of the speed boosting that was relevant in Titanfall 2, Apex Legends kept some of the more important tech. For instance, slide hopping was nerfed, but is still very effective in some circumstances, especially when healing. You can also wall climb and air strafe. Apex Legends showed once again that a game with complex and expressive movement mechanics could be a top seller and an esport. It really does seem like the industry is coming around on this one. Well, until the devs actively tried to remove slide hopping from the game because they felt it made healing overpower. But they failed, just like all Valve devs used to, so let's just ignore that. Speaking of developers going with the flow of movement, in 2019, the long-awaited sequel to the Doom reboot was released, and they also doubled down on their design philosophy. Taking the action to the enemy and keeping combat fast-paced and alive was the goal this time, and increased movement was definitely on the mind of the developers. Now with pole swings, grapple hooks, double dashes, Doom Guy can slay demons faster than ever. While once again, there was no air strafing, you could maintain momentum by jumping the instant you land. There was also the invention of the technique, hook swinging, where you hook an enemy with a super shotgun and swing around them to gain velocity. This velocity can then be kept by bunny hopping and cause you to traverse insanely fast. Developers such as id Software grew up on games like Quake, and it shows. The games like Half-Life and Counter-Strike that inspired them to join the industry show as their influence right on their sleeve. And for someone who loves expressive movement mechanics, this is great. It seems large sections of the industry are looking towards utilizing movement more in their design. Even teams made entirely of amateurs can create something phenomenal when inspired. Look no further than Black Mesa, a total remake of the original Half-Life by Modders officially backed and licensed by Valve and posted on Steam. This game is a semi-faithful remake of the original Half-Life on a similar engine to Half-Life 2. While it is a remake, the mechanics are not all the same. Functionally, it works the same as Half-Life 2, except there is no ABH or AFH. They also added a new slide mechanic similar to Titanfall 2, except in this game, you don't jump out of it. Sliding actually removes the speed cap on bunny hopping, but you never actually leave the ground. This causes the player to do some sort of slithering movement across the ground to gain speed. While you don't gain speed with bunny hopping in Black Mesa, it is still possible. It's just tick perfect, and maintains momentum, never increasing it. This seems sort of backwards to me at least. One of the best parts of the original Half-Life was its robust movement mechanics, and once again they're being tampered with to get a narrowly tailored experience. Half-Life was not done yet, though. In March of 2020, Valve released their first title on their new hardware, the Index. The Index and Half-Life Alex were Valve's first foray into virtual reality. Half-Life Alex does have some new mechanics when it comes to traversal that some other games in VR don't have right now. While the traditional blinking into a new location is still present here, there is also minor locomotion, without the teleportation and it's probably the best integration we've seen of it thus far. While I don't expect there to be any insane bunny hopping tech, it is still really cool to see Valve tinkering with the fundamentals of movement, especially in a genre that needs it as much as VR. So that pretty much brings us up to today. Before I give my closing remarks, I just want to note a bunch of honorable mentions. These are games that have bunny hopping mechanics or something similar but are just not impactful enough on a cultural level to be included on this list. Movement tech is one of the most fundamental aspects of game design. 
While it is often overlooked, some developers have crafted some of the most satisfying experiences in gaming, all based around movement. They did not always do so intentionally, whether it's because you speedrun, play competitively at a high level, or just enjoy the mechanics themselves, a lot of people really enjoy the expressive and complex movement mechanics in the games that we have discussed. I think that whether it's bunny hopping or some other sort of movement mechanic, it should seriously be considered when making new gaming experiences. And I think that developers are finally coming around and embracing the love for movement. Whether it's id Software or Respawn Studios, I hope that this trend continues so that today won't mark the end of the history of bunny hopping. So that was a whole lot of information. I tried to cover as much of the history of bunny hopping as I possibly could in one video. I did a lot of research for this, and I really enjoyed this project. If you did too, please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share this video. Thank you so much for watching. I just want to send a huge shout out to everyone that helped me write this video. It was definitely my biggest project yet. So much love to Table, Dilly, Bloodshot9001, Seeker, Burhack, Brian Otto, Ripper Phoenix, Wayzone, The Parkles, CRISPR Speedruns, Eurus, Redman SSBM, Devo, Utsu, Agreed is Good, Usishi, The Quake and Left 4 Dead Speedrun Discords, and those people who made tutorials for each of these games on speedrun.com, as well as many, many more.